Okay, back to nice Gold Coast weather. Enough of the Sydney stuff for this week. Uh, I promised last week, or I said last week, I'd try and find a kangaroo. I found a kangaroo. It was right there. <laughs> and then as they're prone to do, hopped away. So no kangaroo. We're sitting in a nice garden instead. Uh, as you can see, for those of you watching, shorts, t-shirts, very relaxed environment here. What are we at today on the Gold Coast? 29 degrees Celsius, <laughs> which is quite nice. So it's actually starting to feel like summer here. Now, um, just to begin with, <laughs> there is going to be some content in this week's weekly update about some data breaches of a very adult nature. If you don't want to listen to that or if you have kids in the car or something like that, you might want to tune out by the time I get to that. I'll tell you before I do. It's going to be a little bit after some of the other InfoSec stuff. But I think it's interesting and it warrants discussion. Uh, and I learned some things. Admittedly, things I didn't want to learn, but I learned some things. So, kicking off this week, uh, yeah, here's an interesting one. In fact, I had not seen this come across my radar uh, until it, it popped up on the Twitters, but it does make a lot of sense, and it's about Chrome blocking mixed content. Now, mixed content is when we load a page over HTTPS, but then there are things embedded in the page which are loaded over HTTP. Uh, so traditionally what's happened is, uh, certainly in Chrome, if you've embedded, say, an image over HTTP into an HTTPS page, you would then get a little warning indicator up in the address bar to say, hey, there's actually mixed, co mixed content, the entire page is no longer secure. Images still load, over HTTP wouldn't be secure. If you had active content, so for example, JavaScript, it would actually be blocked. You get to keep your padlock, unlike mixed content, which is passive, such as an image, keep your padlock, but then over the other side of the browser on the top right-hand corner, you've got a little shield with a red indicator and a warning saying it's been blocked. If you unblocked it and you loaded active content over an HTTP connection, then you'd lose your padlock and you get a big red warning sign. Uh, the best possible way we had of dealing with this, other than not embedding stuff insecurely, is to use a content security policy and use upgrade insecure requests, which would upgrade everything embedded insecurely in every browser except for Internet Explorer, which frankly we don't really care about anymore. So that was days gone by. Now here is what's coming in Chrome, and this is what's quite interesting. So this was a blog post on uh, October 3. I didn't notice it till just the other day. Today we're announcing that Chrome will gradually start ensuring that HTTPS pages can only load secure HTTPS sub resources. In a series of steps outlined, we'll start blocking mixed content by default. Then, ch then uh, uh, this change will improve user privacy and security on the web and prevent a, uh, present a clearer browser security to UX to users. Oh man, I'm struggling today. All right, so without going through the whole thing of the timeline, uh, in Chrome 79, which is slated for December, we'll introduce a new setting to unblock mixed content on specific sites. Reading this, this sounds very enterprise, doesn't it? You know, like we've got an enterprise application. We would like it to do screwy things and rather than fixing it, we'll just like hide the warnings. The more interesting bits come in Chrome 80, which is then looking at January, uh, where mixed audio and video resource will, resources will be auto upgraded to HTTPS, which is cool because this is almost like automatic upgrade and secure requests. Chrome will, uh, so I have to go to there, and Chrome will block them by default if they fail to load our HTTPS. So it's like only HTTPS, if you can't do HTTPS, the thing gets blocked. Uh, and also in Chrome 80, mixed images will still be allowed to load, but they will cause Chrome to show a not secure chip in the Omnibox, which of course is your big search bar across the top. In Chrome 81, mixed Im images will be upgraded to HTTPS and Chrome will block them if they fail to load over HTTPS. So effectively, Chrome is, is, is sort of going down this upgrade and secure request by default route, which, which is good. Of course, the only problem we're going to have here is if there are websites that sort of depended on loading things insecurely uh, and they can't load them over a secure connection, so the, the host name that's being requested just doesn't support HTTPS at all. And that's obviously then going to cause problems because the content won't load. But it's the right thing to do. And it's, it's a sort of gradual transition of forcing the web to go more and more secure, giving people time, giving them warning. Uh, and ultimately, I can't see things like this actually causing really serious issues. Certainly not issues that people really shouldn't be aware of already. Other than enterprise applications, but we're back there again. So that's super cool. Uh, this was posted by uh, Emily Stark and Carlos Juan Rafael. Carlos. <laughs> so, uh, good stuff from those guys. Now, speaking of browsers and HTTPS and security indicators and all this sort of thing, Chrome 70 has dropped, the Chrome 70, Firefox 70 has just dropped and it has finally killed off the EV indicator. 
Now this has been a long time coming and I do take some pleasure in seeing this because it was such an absolute waste of space. And I've spoken many, many times about this and written many, many times about how EV is dead and it was useless for years before we actually got to the point of killing it. So I do watch this happen with some degree of pleasure, <laughs> quite admittedly, because it does see people like Scott Hill and myself, uh, I guess our views reinforced, which is nice. What is still of much amusement to me is to look at some of the arguments just trying to resurrect this dead, dead thing. And someone, someone who is probably Scott, <laughs> pointed me at a thread here uh, where someone has posted onto the... Uh, what's this? This is the mozilla.dev.security.policy Google group. And... <laughs> uh, this gives you a good idea of just how poorly misunderstood a lot of this is. So, <laughs> someone said here, Congratulations to Mozilla and its Firefox team. Here is the ZDNet article from today. And the title here is, Germany's Cybersecurity Agency, this is the BSI, recommends Firefox's most secure browser. And effectively what we get down to here is he's saying, uh, according to BSI's new guide to be considered secure, literally in quotes, a modern browser must satisfy these requirements. One of these requirements is talking about BSI finding that Firefox is the only browser to support EV. Now this is a really, really scary thing. Now, I think I know what he think he means, but I don't think that he actually understands that what he means is different to what he's saying. And where this is really getting down to is, let's take Chrome. Uh, and, and, and Firefox as of today, which is after the bloke wrote this, because this was October 18, which is one week ago. So Chrome still supports EV. They killed it off last month in terms of the visual indicator in the address bar. It still supports EV. If you go to an EV website, it still loads. The thing doesn't crash. You can still inspect the name of the entity by clicking on the padlock, and then immediately you see it. So for those three people in the world, rounds to three, uh, who actually look at visual indicators in the browser for things like identity name and EV, you can still see that. As of today, or a couple of days ago, when Mozilla killed it off in Firefox as well, you can still see it. Both browsers still support it. So this bloke's just gone on an absolute total rant here about something which is completely incorrect. Because he goes on here and he says, I hope the Mozilla community will celebrate this honour but we'll also reconsider its proposal to drop support for EV certificates. That didn't work out real well, did it, mate? That would mean Firefox no longer meets all BSI requirements for a secure browser. This is just bullshit. It's just completely wrong in so many ways. Um, <laughs> and then it's like some of the usual suspects who just, again, beat this visual indicator dr drum over and over and over again somehow hoping it's going to change the reality of all the browsers having dropped it. Uh, anyway, I'll link to this because it's amusing reading. I find it amusing anyway. So fortunately, where that leaves us now is that every time someone pops up and says, visual indicators are really important and we really should still have the EV indicator. So, well, good luck with that because none of the browsers do it anymore. The only one that still does it as of today of the big four is going to be Edge. How many people really use Edge? It would be interesting to see, actually. Will Microsoft drop it, given the Safari and the Chrome and the Firefox situation? If only I knew someone in Microsoft to ask. That would be an interesting question. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. Like the rest of this is pointless. <laughs> so, um, oh, boy. Speaking of pointless. Now, this is going to be the bit where I start talking about the data breaches of a very explicit nature. And how should we best do this? I want to try and be objective and factual about this. It is hard not to talk about it without casting your own sort of moral judgment on it. And in some faces, some faces, in some places, find it like a combination of uh, abhorrent or amusing. Now they, boy, where do we even start? Let's just get into it. There's a website called Zooville. Uh, Zooville is for zoophilia and bestiality, which is basically humans and animals. Okay, humans are animals, but humans and other animals other than humans uh, enjoying intimate moments together, uh, which also includes pornography, and apparently, uh, strictly speaking, pornography is still the word, if it was a human and an animal uh, engaged in a sex act. Now, 
There's this data breach of Zooville, or 70,000 plus records. Uh, V-Bulletin popped, V-Bulletin had a, a zero day recently. If you didn't patch it really, really quickly, you got all your things owned, they were in that. Um, there is a separate discussion here about why on earth would you self-manage V-Bulletin. I just, okay, cost, but here we are. <laughs> Don't do that, go to managed platforms. I've ranted about this many, many times before. So a whole bunch of stuff has been breached. Now, a, a discussion then ensued uh, about what my responsibility was to report it to law enforcement. And that the, the position that a few people made is that because I'm aware of this site, I should report it to law enforcement. Now, there are multiple different things to unpack here. First of all, this is a clear web website. This is not a dark web website or a hidden service. It runs on the clear web. You can go to, you probably don't want to, but you could go to this website right now in your normal browser. So it is out there, it is mainstream, based on archive.org. It's been there since at least the beginning of the year. So this is not something that just popped up yesterday. It's been there for quite some time. So it is out there in the public domain. You can find it on Google. It is well indexed. Apparently SEO is a thing in the bestiality world. As I said, the things you learn. Um, it also turns out there are many different subgenres of this. So, and, and, and again, this is where I said this is probably not what you, what you want to listen to with kids or if this is not your not your thing. Look, it's not my thing either, but I just find the whole thing fascinating as it relates to breaches. But the, the genres include uh, performing the act itself uh, with an animal or also looking at pornography, which was created about others performing the act with the animal. And the legality of it is actually quite different. Now, where this, a, again, sort of relates to data breaches and my responsibilities, for the people that popped up and said, look, I should be reporting this to law enforcement, I said, well, there's a few issues here. Clear web website, running there for months, there has now been a data breach and I have the data. Does that then make it my responsibility to report to law enforcement, given that the data breach doesn't really change the fact that it's out there, there's tens of thousands of people using it, it's indexed by Google, it's not exactly a secret. It's a well-known thing, I guess, within those circles or for anyone who wants to look for it. So I didn't feel completely confident on that perspective. The other thing, and this is where I really did learn stuff that I didn't expect to learn, I'm gonna open up some of the references here, is it turns out, depending on where you are in the world or depending on where you are in America, for the US listeners, it is actually legal. Now, I'm going to open this just because it's it's fascinating in an oddly strange way. But um, there's a couple of Wikipedia pieces here. Uh, Zoophila in the law. Zoophila in the law looks at the laws governing humans performing sex acts with non-human animals. Laws against humans performing sex acts on animals where they exist are concerned with the actual act, which is commonly referred to which it commonly refers to as bestiality, rather than the sexual attraction of animals. Now, again, I, I did warn you, like this is a weird, weird weekly update. For this reason, prohibitions of zoophilic pornography are more varied. So this is sort of owning images of the act. They may be unlawful if an actual sector with an animal is involved, but the status is not clear and it goes on and on and on. So just to without sort of destroying the whole sort of interesting thing here. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> I'm just looking at the legality by country. Um, there are a bunch of countries where it is legal. So just looking at the map, all of Russia, legal. Finland, legal. Oh boy, I, I, I know I've got Finnish listeners. Um, I am, that is Finland on the map, isn't it? Uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Yeah, Finland, legal. Uh, Argentina legal. Interesting. Now, the, the reason I said oh boy is that when you read down the illegal list, illegal, this is the range of different things that can happen, goes all the way from uh, an unenforced penalty through to death penalty. Holy crap, where do you get the death penalty? Man, well that's, uh, that is, uh, that is interesting. Let me just search for death on this because it, like, wow, not immediately clear. Um, now one of the, so there's, there's quite a few red bits here, up to life imprisonment, up to life imprisonment in India, which is the obvious big one there. Uh, also a bunch of countries in Africa, uh, some South America. Now the interesting thing here as well is, and this is where it gets really, really freaking weird, is, <laughs> as if it wasn't weird enough already, depending on where you are in the USA, it can be legal. Now this is the <laughs> really curious thing, look at this map, we've got one state, and uh, apologies, I'm not really good on all my US states, particularly the ones in the middle, but there's one state, 
uh, which appears to be next to um, uh, Washington, um, Washington State, of course, where it is up to life imprisonment, and then the state right next to it is legal. Now, of those US states, where were we here? There's literally a Wikipedia page. Where, <laughs> again, these were things I really didn't want to learn this week. Literally a Wikipedia page titled Legality of Bestiality in the United States. And you go here, and it's, uh, let's copy that, and let's open that in the browser. Uh, Hawaii is the one that, that um, comes immediately to mind, given that I have spent a little bit of time in Hawaii. So why, why is it legal in Hawaii? And I mean, frankly, the rest of the world does find it quite strange just how different laws are in different states of the same country. Um, but yeah, Hawaii was one of the states in which it's, it's, it is actually legal. What else was on here? So it's Hawaii, uh, da, da, da. Hawaii, Kentucky, and West Virginia. So if you're in any of those three states, apparently that's quite okay. And then the legality, if I look back at the global one, it differs depending on whether, the column headings here, whether you're looking at the sale and distribution of zoophilic pornography, so images, versus the ownership of, zoo, of zoophilic pornography versus bestiality itself, which is the actual act. Now, I've spent more time than what I really want to talking about that particular topic, but I, what I find interesting here is that regardless of where your moral compass lies on this, and I think most of us are going to be pretty much on the same heading on this one, the reality of it is we're talking about something which is, which is legal, not only in a bunch of... Sorry about that. Someone started calling my phone, which killed the recording. I'll call those guys back. So, <laughs> where were we? Pro maybe that's a good indicator it's time to change the topic. Um, so, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, not only is it legal in some parts of the world, which, which us and sort of the Western Hemisphere side of things might feel is a long way away culturally from us, but it's legal literally in parts of the US. So, when we're having these discussions about the legal status of things running on the internet, we've got to recognise just how varied it is. Now, I don't know if, for example, Zooville runs in Hawaii. And if it's a Hawaiian website, does that mean that like, after they have a data breach, how much obligation is there on me to report it legally? Now, all of that said, I did reach out to someone in government in a cybersecurity capacity who is responsible for some of these things uh, to put this to them. And that's, that, that's probably a discussion I won't, uh, won't relay here in public, but I am interested in the status of that and what my responsibility is as well. So that was the first uh, one of a somewhat ex very explicit nature. The other one that happened uh, this week was hookers.nl. Now, uh, the domain name is probably pretty self-explanatory. If we were to talk about, I'm just opening up, have I been pwned to see how many were in this? If we were to talk about the uh, TLD, this of course is the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands is rather famous for this sort of thing. It is... Again, a rather sensitive data breach. It had, this is why I'm trying to open Have I Been Poem, but the internet here ain't particularly great. Uh, it had a, about a quarter of a million people in it. As best I can tell, a legally operating site. does appear to be in Dutch, so obviously a very Netherlands-centric uh, service. A lot of personal data leaked out of this service. And yeah, both of these data breaches, when into Have I Been Poem, flagged as sensitive for very obvious reasons. It's it's just sort of a little bit of a reminder as well about just how much your information gets leaked and the impact on people. Imagine if you're in one of those data breaches, particularly the first one, and someone else discovers that. I mean, that's just, that is, regardless of your moral compass, that is life ruining for some people. Uh, and if you sort of think everyone's just signing up there with fake email addresses, again, I can't check because the internet's not loading, but there was a very high prevalence, 30 40%, I think, in both those cases, of email addresses that were already in Have I Been Pwned. I sent out many, many hundreds of email notifications to the approaching 3 million subscribers of Have I Been Pwned. There's a bunch of these email addresses that people actively use and have subscribed and verified. There are a bunch of .gov email addresses across the two. There are a bunch of big corporate domains across the two. So I would hate to be the person working in the organisation that gets a domain notification from Have I Been Pwned that says you need to talk to someone about zoophilia. That would not be a fun discussion at all. So that said, I think it's probably a good place to try and wrap this up. Uh, blog sponsor this week is Veronis. Uh, so I've had Veronis as a blog sponsor for quite a long time. I've done many, many free courses for Veronis over the years as well. 
That's not what they're plugging this week. This week they are plugging the seven hidden Office 365 security settings you can unlock with PowerShell. Another free course made by someone else. I'm sure it's great and it is available from Veronis. I'm gonna put a link in my uh, blog that accompanies this video to that. And next week, I'm gonna to come to you from Melbourne. But that'll be a different story. I'll talk about what I'm doing in Melbourne after I get there. Actually, I should talk about it in advance, just in case anyone is in either Sydney or Melbourne, I'm gonna be at the Ping Identity Conference in Sydney on Tuesday, and then the same one in Melbourne on Thursday. So if you're in either Sydney or Melbourne, go and check that conference out. I'll be there. I'll be doing a bunch of other community stuff during that time as well. Not all of it open, but uh, I will be getting around making the most of the time, and then I'll come to you from Melbourne next week. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate this was probably not the subject matter you maybe wanted to hear on your drive to work, but regardless, cybersecurity incidents, data breach related, relevant. Thank you very much.